Hey, hey, welcome to Over the Horizon. There's been a bit of a, a kerfuffle in the space uh, industry. NASA announcing that the Mars Sample Return Program is in a bit of trouble. Um, there was uh, a press conference uh, and we had the NASA administration officials and uh, scientists announced that the program was pretty much uh, going over budget and uh, they didn't see a way for tried and tested technology to succeed. And so they were going to look for solutions and innovative solutions in the private industry. All right. So let's just quickly make sense of all of that. Let me bring in my guest today back with us. Ben Inoue from NASA JPL, thank you so much. Uh, also, Ozan and Scott Walter. Great to have uh, all of you guys back again. Let's get straight to it. Um, ben, first takeaways, uh, you're at JPL. What's going on? Sure, and uh, just to be clear that, you know, I'm here in my own capacity, share my own opinions. So, um, yeah. NASA disowns me at this point. That's fine with me. Um, <laughs> no, no. Look, we're, we're, sure. the idea of having this conversation is to try and understand what's going on, because not everybody's watched the uh, the town hall or tuned into the telecom. So this is a great opportunity to educate the audience. Right? We're sure. not going to get into any controversies. That's not Absolutely. the idea at all. And I'm hoping to let NASA also know this. So, having said that, yeah. give us a sense of what's going on. Because it's 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 quite a bit confusing. We don't know where this program is headed and, and what's sure. really happening with it. Yeah, and just to give a little bit of context here, uh, Mars Sample Return was originally supposed to launch in 2028, well, the lander itself, um, and return samples in the early 2030s. Um, we have been in the... Pro we're actually building hardware for that baseline already, and we have been for about a year now. The the total spent on it has been in the neighborhood of $3 billion. Uh, and the total life cycle cost is supposed to be uh, somewhere between five and seven billion as a uh, NASA administrator called out in his discussion with the media. Uh, what happened was in September, end of September, there was a, a report released by an independent review board convened by NASA to evaluate the technical and programmatic and budgetary performance of the project so far. And it was determined that the cost estimates uh, that we were working to uh, generated originally a few years back uh, during the first independent review board uh, were not credible. And the actual mission cost was going to come in between eight and $11 billion. Uh, so the Senate got wind of this before the IRB actually released its report um, and wrote a very um, explicit statement in, in their legislature for the 2024 budget saying that if it was going to be more than 10% of the projected 5.4 billion, the mission should be canceled and the money should go to Artemis. Um, okay. and so just to be clear, the mission is still on. The mission is still on as right. of right now. Um, okay. But the direction that we saw yesterday was mm -hmm. that it's almost certainly not going to survive in its current form. So uh, the message that we received was we're going to slow down and or pause the mission, do a reformulation and a call for proposals to private industry, essentially a, a nearly clean slate uh, look at what we need to do for this mission and um, what seemed to be an implied budgetary limit of a life cycle cost of $7 billion, which I assume mm -hmm. that we would subtract the three from. So let's do it over for $4 billion total was, I think, the takeaway for me. Okay. Okay. So speaking of budgets, I just want to quickly play out uh, a soundbite from the teleconference. Uh, listen. I to clarify something. So you mentioned that you could bring back the samples before 2040 if you had a bigger budget. So if you could get more money, would you use the same architecture for the mission? And also, what kind of industry contracts are you looking to have? Um, oh, wow. That's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, the, so looking at the results of the Independent Review Board, um, you know, we, that this is why we chose to pause the current mission architecture in 24, um, because the, the mission did have um, some 
uh, challenges in both cost and schedule. So um, we were already taking a pause regardless of the, uh, the budget environment. Um, and what kind of, uh, and obviously the contracts with industry will depend on the, uh, the, the architecture that we choose to move forward with. Okay, so that was uh, NASA Associate Administrator, uh, Nikki, uh, Nikki Nicola Fox. But I want you to pay close attention now to what NASA Administrator Billy Nelson had to say and the tone of his voice and what it conveys, because I want to get into this and, and understand what really is going on. Listen. But remember, we were put in this situation because of the cutbacks by the Congress of the spending. And that's what we are having to respond to. Uh, and that is the whole point of what we have announced today. So is this a problem that's originating clearly from, from, from the budgetary allocations? But is this Congress is, it does it really the fault lie at Congress's uh, doors at, at, at Congress's door? I don't disagree that we are in a title, tighter fiscal scenario uh, everywhere in the U.S. federal government, and I would expect um, cons you know constriction everywhere. Uh, I, I don't particularly appreciate uh, what I thought was a political narrative um, in response to. A scientific challenge. Uh, I, I think if anything in the U.S. is a political, it's our science and exploration activities and, and NASA especially. Um, and so that type of uh, language in in this context is a little bit strange to me. Um, yeah, yeah. It's so, a little. It's, it's more more than a little out of sync. It appears because we're talking about science here, and this is vital science uh, that's really yeah. at the core of of NASA's uh, programs right now and its Decadel program. Um, but this is, I want to play out the sound bite now, and this is interesting because they talk about this balance between tried and tested and then yet having to go to industry for innovative solutions. Listen. What level of technolo technology detail is considered when planning mission architecture? In 2021, 2022, we found that we needed either a large than ever lander to deliver the MAV or a smaller MAV. Might we need new technology for both? I'm, I'm, I'm going to look over at my technical team that's, uh, I mean, yes, yes, we may need new technology. Um, right. That's why we're going to industry to yeah. actually uh, yeah. ask them for, you know, what, what technology is out there. Um, you know, the, the larger than ever lander is extremely, extremely challenging. That's that, but that's driven often by a large Mars ascent vehicle. So, um, you, you heard in my, <clears throat> excuse me, in my opening remarks, um, that, you know, one of the. One of the things that we really want to find is, is there a smaller MAV concept? Um, Doug, you're nodding and pointing, and I'd like you to jump in. <laughs> and you turn my mic on. <laughs> uh, no, I agree um, that those are the drivers of mass and those are the drivers of cost and complexity. So it's important to drive those down and the, and the call for uh, proposals and ideas is, is focused on changing those large elements of the of the uh, architecture that drive both cost and schedule. Can I add in? Uh, please, please do, Steve, yes. Um, what we also find is that when we look at these flagship missions, we end up def perhaps over-defining requirements, which then drive us to solutions that are perhaps more capable than what we need. And so this call allows us to revisit that, to make certain that we have the right requirements to then see what the architectures could be and therefore improved costs. So we're not looking for technology investments or developments to actually find the solution. We're actually looking for um, the, the minimum capability to achieve the success, and we think that might be enabling. Yeah. Okay. So there seems to be this repeated stress on going with tried and tested technology and belief in their technology, in NASA's technology. Yet at the same time. Um, having no choice but to go to, to private industry. And I want to play out another quick bite before we sound bite before we you know throw it open to the panel and bring Scott and Ozan in for more on this. Listen to this. This is another stress on the so-called tried and tested technology. In the world have been working on Mars sample return for decades. What does NASA leadership expect industry to bring to the table? Innovative concepts, greater risk tolerance. How does involving industry uh, at this stage reduce the overall cost of the mission if the goals of the mission are unchanged? 
Um, that's a that's a great question. Obviously, we um, we do have the best and the brightest minds um, at uh, JPL and our NESA centers who have been working on this. Um, the it it is it is unfortunate um, that uh, the the climate that we're in does not support the architecture um, as uh, as described. Um, we do want to move forward, and so we are opening up the uh, the aperture and allowing industry to propose concepts. Um, yes, we would be uh, uh, okay with a higher risk posture, um, definitely looking at things that have high heritage, the kind of tried and true um, architectures, uh, elements of architectures that maybe have worked uh, in the past different ways of doing um, the, uh, the the various elements. I mentioned, you know, a, a smaller Mars Ascent vehicle. Um, if you uh, certainly what I've learned from my bright minds at JPL is um, that, uh, you know, the more we land, the harder it is to take off. So um, uh, that, you know, the size of that map is really very key. So, um, uh, you know, looking looking at ways that we can infuse um, new ways of uh, of doing things. And possibly from different industries. From different industries, yes. All right. So there seems to be this internal struggle. Um, and to borrow a phrase from Ozan, who called it a bit of a, an oxymoronish uh, predicament, right? Um, ben, I'll let, let you start, and then uh, we can go to Scott and Ozan and uh, you know take this discussion forward. <laughs> I'll be real quick, because I definitely want to hear from Scott and Ozan. But there were a lot of conflicting ideas in there. Um, you know, tried and true, more heritage versus uh, higher risk tolerances or immediately right after each other. Um, and, and we have this pervasive addictive addiction to the promises of, of heritage and how that's lowering cost. But sometimes that drives complexity, trying to fit things that aren't supposed to go together together. Um, and then the, the last thing she mentioned a couple of times was the mass of the MAV, um, which is not developed at JPL. That's uh, a Goddard mm -hmm. Space Flight. Um, center that's building that and so that the right the mass the, of the MAV drives the whole vehicle um, and as the lander gets heavier to accommodate a better a MAV you know you need a, a bigger lander more fuel and you have to make decisions about EDL etc and, and everything yeah it's cascading um, but anyway I'll, I'll I'll turn it over uh, to my friends here Scott Ozan okay who wants to go first Scott do you want to yeah, I'll, I'll just say that, um, you know, listening to a lot of it, you, you, you did, you heard so many different things. I wasn't quite sure that there was like a theme that tied it all together. I was trying to find a common thread. Um, in, in some respects, when you're starting to hear things like, you know, over-designed and too capable and, you know, it's going to take too long and cost too much. It harkens back to an earlier NASA era led by Dan Golden, known as faster, cheaper, better. <laughs> That's almost seemed like the, the mantra that was like, part of them was trying to talk about and the other was like um almost like a desperate plea we we're not quite sure how, how to handle this can we get some innovation in here and a bit of a word salad sometimes to trying to figure out what was actually what was the ask and i guess the ask is that we just need to be able to go collect those samples and bring it back and for those who don't quite remember what the architecture of the surface was is like one half of the Mars sample return has already been done. And that is we've sent the rover to go there and actually collect the samples we want to return. The, the problem is, is that uh, the it was one of those kick the can down the road kind of things. It's like, well, we don't know how we're going to get it back. We're just going to collect them anyway. So we're going to worry about that problem later because there's a certain amount of time to collect the samples. So why don't we, rather than wait for having the whole architecture here, at least get the first half done. And then the other idea is that like once you do the first half, it's really hard to, to cancel the second half. So they're there, the samples are, are there, and now we just have to figure out what the architecture is to bring them back. And that is really where the big cost drivers are. And I guess maybe one question I'd ask Ben, you, know, you mentioned that there's already about 3 million that has been invested in the Mars sample return. Does that include Brilliant. the sample Brilliant. gathering or is that just the return part? Uh, billion, that, that's just the return part. This, okay, so that so there's additional money that's already gone into the rover and, and ingenuity and all that. That's a completely different budget. Yeah, that the rover it was on the order of four and a half billion in total uh, is the life cycle cost, and then on top of that is what the MSR cost will be, uh, mm -hmm. of which about three billion has been spent already. We're about five years, four four or five years into it now. Um, when we're calling this start from zero. Mm -hmm. 
Hang on, let me just pull up the um, the press release that. Uh, so this is then help us uh, make a bit of sense of what's going on. So we are expecting the capture containment and return system um, by 2030. That's still the schedule, correct? Um, the launch sample retrieval system, the sorry, the ascent vehicle uh, in 2020 by 2035 and the return of samples to Earth by 2040. Is this a change from the original schedule or is it, is it still the same? This is a major, major change. Um, and one of the things that they repeated that they were trying to do with this interim alternate architectural proposal was um, reduce the number of parallel elements that have to happen and serialize launches, which is directly result in the essentially you're pushing the return date out by about 10 years from the baseline because you've pushed your launches you know of the four different elements once every two years uh, and then two years for return rather than trying to sync up uh, four launches within two years so um because of the various different elements they were they felt like uh the irb actually noted that the parallelism of the elements and the requirement for them to be executed at the same time with no slippage led to um, a, a lack of robustness in the mission architecture. Uh, and so when we're talking about architecture, we're not just talking about the physical, you know, how do you build the thing, but like, how do you architect the planning or how do you manage the programmatics, how you manage the timeline that all becomes part of that architecture discussion that they're mentioning. So yeah, yes, this pushes it out 10 years. Um, and, you know, Bill Nelson opened up his remarks with, uh, okay, I, I know you heard from the MERT recently that uh, we we are, we are would baseline 2040 and 10 billion. Um, and his first remark was, that's too long and that's too much. Um, yeah. And somebody in private industry, please help us figure out how to do it otherwise. So... Um, it's a it's not a good look <laughs> yeah it was it was weird we'll call it weird yeah <laughs> all right well, I mean, to, um, to, to, to ben's point okay to ben's point this is a really difficult position for a lot of people to be in at, at GP, jpl and it's a, a huge ask to have something that was originally baselined um optimistically for five to seven billion uh, to be done for four uh, with, you know, what, 10 or 20 years of inflation uh, not accounted for as well. And then, uh, you know, one other thing is that when you're costing this this out, like you still have a lot of JPL and Goddard people probably who are going to be involved in this. It's not, you know, you know, turning off that tap right away. So the money that's actually available for the private contributions to the program will be even less than that right is that is that is that a fair expectation ben yeah i, I think that's right i think it's four billion for all of uh the american contribution to msr so um yeah you know you, you subtract what hq is going to need because they've moved programmatic management over to their uh to nasa hq you know yeah. you subtract map development I'm, I'm almost certain uh goddard will hold on to mav uh but we'll see. Yeah, it's yeah. It, it would be a challenge. Right. You know, I, I guess I could compare it a little bit to, um, you know, the Artemis uh, lunar lander contract for Starship, which I think is two point three billion, right? Uh, it's I think two point eight for the for the or some somewhere around somewhere around three billion. Yeah. So I mean, if they conceivably build a vehicle that can land on the moon and take off again, and it's going to cost two point eight, um, it should cost many a multiple of that to do the same thing on Mars. Uh, yeah. And so I think even Starship with its maturity will struggle to hit that number. I don't yeah. doubt that they could do it, but it's not going to be for 4 billion. Yeah. So I, you know, uh, kind of what, what I was going to add to this is that uh, mm -hmm. the, the opportunity here as, as big of a challenge as this is the opportunity mm -hmm. here is actually to leverage not only a private industry for the ways that they do things, but for, um, existing spending 
and and leveraging what they have already built. So, you know, no. with, with the HLS contract, SpaceX got $3 billion for it, not because that's how much it cost them, but because that's how much was available. And this was something that they were mostly planning to do themselves. So they only needed incentive to do the delta between what they were already planning to do for their own purposes of uh, initially star starling launches uh, to Earth orbit, and then and then you know they've been talking about Mars colonization from for the past twenty years, <laughs> uh, and and you know turn that into a lunar lander, and I think that that actually is likely there's a good chance that that ended up uh, that will end up costing not uh, too much more than three billion or possibly a lot less than three billion uh and then if, if you factor in future flights to the moon then th that that investment from them of building the system and then and then modifying it for nasa use will likely pay off um scott, scott when we look at I, mars i, I want to ask you i want to ask you just sorry to interject but right now is there any other private player that looks set to compete with SpaceX for a possible contract in this. Yeah, there are there are a few. I would okay. say there are a few. But, but Star, Starship is is the is the best position for for one reason. Starship was originally designed for a Mars landing. In, in fact, turning it into a lunar lander uh, is more of a delta uh, compared to what they were what, what they uh, you know set out to do and what they where they're planning to go. Um, so. In some ways, the delta for a mission like this, I expect, would be a lot less than the delta for a lunar landing. Right. And that's that's where it's it's like, yeah, on the one hand, all the money that, that will have gone into it will be a lot more than four billion dollars. On the other hand, they're already planning to do most, you know, 95 percent of the work uh, required for at least the landing. Mm -hmm. um, I think the return part. Uh, Starship uh, will not be ready. Well, they want to be ready, but I don't think that they will be ready um, in in time for when we would like this to happen, as opposed to when we are temporarily expecting it to happen. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I think that it will well, be ready. Twenty forty, but, <laughs> but 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 twenty forty is a return, right? Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think Starship will be ready by 2040, but you know, <laughs> okay, it'd be nice right. to get it back, get the samples back sooner, right, right Ben? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it, it seems like by the time Starship's ready to do a return mission, you would already be thinking about having people fly out there, you know? Yeah, so you know, let the there's I, I think there are a lot of companies that are probably positioned. Not a lot. There are some companies that are positioned to like, you know, provide an alternate to Starship. Uh, I don't think any of them are in good position, though. You know, they could do it, but unless the money and the incentives are right, uh, which I don't think for is right for most companies, uh, it might work for SpaceX because they want to do it anyway. And this is just offsetting their total yeah, cost. Exactly. Yeah. But who else is in that situation? I, I don't think anyone is. I mean, yeah. theoretically, Blue Origin, maybe, because, you know, maybe that if that's an aspiration, theoretically. Uh, Bezos, but they're yeah. a long way because you know, they have yet to, to reach orbit. You know, they're, they're building these big boosters that theoretically could do it. They're trying to come up with an HLS system for the, the moon. So they, they're they trying and, to bring that on. And it's just a question of what their time frame would and be. They're, and they're licensing they're the only their technology person. for HLS from us, too, which is interesting. Right. right. Right, but and, the and other... their architecture is a lot better suited for a cis lunar space and, yeah. and lunar yeah. landing than than it is for Mars. Yeah, plus they get someone with deep enough pockets that potentially could bankroll it if he really wanted yeah. to go. Because in theory, wasn't that kind of what was happening with the HLS? Is that they they also were going to do the same thing? Is do it way below cost because they wanted that contract so much. Yeah. So I mean, that's you have to look at it that way. There are companies that may have some technological solutions that can be part of the puzzle, but they may not have was, enough backing and funding and that, everything that's else. That's a wild idea. Do, yes. I mean, does it have to be a Starship life platform as a solution? Or could it be? Because let's, let's not forget that uh, this is a joint program with the ESA. Right, Ben? Uh, where does it the is, ESA yeah. stand on this? There has not been much comment uh, from ESA right now. Uh, they have a very different approach to these ambitious missions I, I would say they uh, 
under promise and tend to over deliver and they tend to hit timelines a little better. Um, but you know, maybe the goals don't become as aspirational. I, I think that they will deliver the part that they plan to deliver on the date that they said they were going to, and they were going to wonder why we're fussing about it so much, you know? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I suspect so, that they do not have the, they will not have the funding to contribute a lander in addition to the ERO. Oh, definitely. Not. Okay. So, so Scott, do you see any way where you could have perhaps just maybe a, a, a conglomerate uh, come together for this solution? But, oh yeah. They, they, yeah. There, there's definitely precedence for that all the time. Even the HSL contract and uh, was it called the, the national team. So you always see these collaborations kind of coming together. Potentially, you might see something like that. So there's definitely companies with the technology. Yep. The question is whether they can afford it to do it alone and they would need to get different pieces. So, I mean, you could see yep. Dynetics could work on maybe some kind of lander. I mean, they already came up with an interesting novel concept for the moon. They didn't win that contract, but it doesn't mean they don't have the chops to do it. Uh, I mean, you could even see, you know, a lot of these upstart companies that maybe could could somehow do something, but they would, would have to really up their game a bit. You know, a uh, rocket lab would be one, but you know, you'd have yeah. to say, well, maybe neutron, you know, until they, they are able to get something like that going. Stokes is working on something that might be like a small piece of the puzzle in one way. There, there's a lot of them that could contribute something or it may be a little bit different. Um, it's, it's hard to say, but I, you know, short of, you know, maybe someone like, you know, Lockheed just decides, ah, we're going to do it all around. They're probably the only one who can just, do it by themselves. All, all the others, I think, would have to they, they don't have the profit profit incentive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's yeah. the thing. They don't have the profit incentive. But so, you know, short of that, mm -hmm. they they would probably be the one that if, if they decided that they go, oh, we're going to do it all on our yeah. own. I, I will add that. one more one more potential team to this. Um, uh, one that's not talked about much is relativity and impulse. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's so relativity is a well funded uh, launch startup. Uh, as far as you know, whether they're objectives are realistic. That's debatable. Uh, they've certainly done well with engine development um, and they've, they've done well with uh, with capital raises and they basically have partnered with Relativity, sorry, with Impulse, which is Tom Mueller, uh, uh, head of uh, propulsion at SpaceX for like 17 years, is his uh, company um, to do a private Mars uh, mission, right? This is something that uh, might not happen, but they're they're working towards this, um, and it doesn't seem like with with the combination of uh, capabilities that they bring to the table, it doesn't seem uh, unrealistic to me that they could pull this off with a modest amount of funding. Um, uh, so, what impulse? Already has is the Rigel engine, which is which is uh, a very is a dirt cheap uh, uh, engine in the right thrust range for propulsive landing uh, after uh, after the main part of deceleration. Uh, they also are working on their Helios tug, which would equip Terran R with enough um, TMI capability, trans, uh, Mars injection capability, to send a substantial lander you know, bigger than what they're working on. And then if you combine that with uh, high at a hypersonic inflatable uh, ablative decelerator, right? Or, or aerodynamic uh, uh, decelerator, which uh, NASA developed in, and uh, ULA is intending to, to use for Vulcan engine recovery. Uh, and, and to my knowledge, NASA developed uh, this technology specifically to be able to large, uh, land larger payloads on Mars. So if you, if you use the combination of those things, then you might actually be able to get a large lander that is, I mean, not Starship sized, but um, big enough that some of these mass constraints are, are relaxed but for, at, at reasonable cost. Problem. But there's one problem with all that. What's that? No heritage and there's no legacy. Well, okay. So so here's the here's the thing. Heritage yeah. and legacy, right? Um I I can't help but wonder if uh there's some give in that in terms of are we looking for something that's gonna 
that that already has heritage now or that is expected to have heritage in flight history in other contexts by the time that you have use for it? Yes, to your question, yes. Both? This is the best. Yes. It doesn't, there's no, there's no defined answer there. It's okay. Pick, pick the pick uh, answer there that you heard it here to... first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, because because the second one that's achievable. Uh, I I think it's it's tough too, right? Um, you know, when we talk about heritage and legacy, um, you know, I, I'll I'll remind viewers that there are three organizations in, in human history that have landed softly on mars all three of them are governments um huh. and uh, arguably only two of them can do it right now and um, all of our work for mars landings um has been done it here at jpl so it's not even even at other nasa centers so it's it's really it's really um you know we want more people involved especially in the u.s uh but it's really hard you know, the atmosphere yeah. is just thin enough um, to burn your space or it's thick enough to burn your spacecraft up. It's too thin to really decelerate you well. Gravity's strong enough to pull you down quickly, um, but uh, it's not strong enough to, to really hold you in a, in, a, in the right way um, and hold on to the, uh, the atmosphere. So it's hard yeah. and we have real big challenges. And, um, You know, the more I think about it, the more I guess we'll use the word ambitious it is to to think that companies that have not yet flown uh, more than a few rockets like would be able to actually land on Mars. Uh, mm -hmm. Much I less mean, just think about it. Ben, this is a great, this is humongous potential for any private industry that wants to, you know, gain from NASA's learnings. I, I agree, but we have one set of samples and if it doesn't work, then, um, sure. then you can throw away, uh, not just your MSR billions, but your Mars 2020 and MSL billions too. So are we willing to bet $20 billion on that? Yeah. So one other question that I have, does this have to be, uh, so I know that they're, they're talking about returning just a subset of the samples, right? So if you turn a subset, then you have an opportunity right? to, Ben, well, there's a 30, but then, 30. but, but I, I think that the requirements for, uh, for the RP that they put, they put out is, uh, you want to be able to return at least 10 of the 30. Okay. Sure. Yeah. That's the roses, uh, proposed call for proposals. Um, so I would, I would, if, if this goes to, it does in fact go to a private company, I would deeply hope that it is only 10, um, yeah. cause I'd like to have three, <laughs> at least three chances to get them back. Yeah. Um, there's actually, I don't remember the exact number, but it's on the order of 40 tubes. Um, these cool mm -hmm. cards behind me actually are uh, a running set of playing cards of what samples there are right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I got, you know, our one of our uh, public engagement offices uh, shared it with me. So I put them in a frame and I think they're cool. But anyway, yeah, there's going to be end up being 40 plus two witness tubes by the end of the collection period. 10 are sitting down at the Three Forks Depot um, at the bottom of Jezero Crater, and the others will be carried on board Perseverance, um, which will eventually be parked, uh, awaiting the arrival of the vehicle to um, pick up the samples and bring them back. I I really hope that... Um, I, I At the end of the day, even if JPL or whoever's doing the, the mission, um, I would rather build three, you know, three of them and bring 10 back each. I, th I think that does do something for your, um, you know, your mission risk posture. Uh, I think that does a lot. I think it's more exciting to build three things than one thing. I would rather have three rocket launches than one rocket launch. Um, uh, so yeah, I, that would be cool to see it as a baseline. It wasn't part of our mission parameter set though. Yeah. Uh, we were told 30 uh, so, uh, at once or yeah. nothing. Well, I think it's safe to say that when your wife sends you out to get a dozen eggs, you do three trips. It's <laughs> <laughs> funny. Oh, Scott, what would we do without you? Here? <laughs> that's good. Yeah, but I mean, think about it. That, that's a long trip. There's so many things that could go wrong. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you know, it depends upon what the architecture is like. You know, that the more operations you have in there, the more likelihood something is going to go wrong. And some 
cases, the more partners you have, the more likelihood something's going wrong. And I'm thinking, was, was it the Mars orbiter or something like that, where, you know, one of the contractors had things, couldn't do the conversion from English units to metric units correctly. Mm, and that's yeah, what like yeah. screwed the whole thing up. And so like, that's one of the things you're kind of paranoid is like the, the more subcontractors have there, the more possibility of something like that coming yeah. in. Um, and, and that was during faster, better, cheaper too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So well, one and, nice and thing here is it was that like if... really not putting all your eggs in one basket and they were just throwing everything out there that, that they could. Yeah. And they actually had a lot of successes. So in some ways yeah. it did work out right. And, and maybe that is the approach is kind of like better, cheaper, faster, which, but three of them. Yeah, you know, because it's yeah, better, agreed. cheaper, faster. We can do it that way. Well, well and, and the other thing is Mer, you know, because that was the the twin rovers, and that was extraordinarily successful. Um, we got lucky with that both survived much longer than we expected. But even if one uh, had, or if they both, you know, hit their minimum lifetime, then it would still be a huge success. Um, so I don't disagree with it, but um, but you have you have to be redundant in that case. Uh, you can't yeah. expect single string success with faster, better, cheaper. Totally. Um, one nice thing is that if you fail, uh, up through landing, you don't, or it, 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 you then don't you just, the you just throw away the billions. Yeah. Not the, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can yeah. set up a contract so that if they, if, uh, your, whoever your provider is fails to land you, uh, they, they have to provide another lander and, you know, you ensure your, uh, your, your MAV. I, I wouldn't another be proposing one. to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I think we mentioned it earlier. Yeah, like I, I'm sure Lloyd will cover it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think SpaceX has the right incentive to like look at any any proposal here as just offsetting the cost of what they're trying to do anyway. Yeah. But again, I don't think anyone else has that same incentive. I think no. everyone else is trying to make money on uh, whatever contract they sign. And that yeah. is a pretty tough value proposition to me. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. So, sure. Billy Nelson yesterday indicated that essentially the success of the MSR program will decide where NASA astronauts go on Mars as a whole and not necessarily Jezero Crater, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. beginning with a landing spot. What, what did he mean by that? And why is this so important? Explain it's it for us. That's a very good question, actually, right in. Um, you know, they, there's a... It, I, we've heard the catchphrase moon to Mars quite a bit, um, but really all we're seeing is moon. Uh, and so actually this was the first time I've heard him discuss like putting humans on Mars, um, you know, mm -hmm. in something that I was watching and really paying attention to anyway. So I'm not sure what, what that whole thing was about, frankly. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the way that MSR relates to getting humans to Mars is uh, proving that we can launch something to the surface of Mars and bring it back. And that's it. It's an engineering proof of concept, um, which I don't want to digress too far, is, in my opinion, one of the the reasons that the mission is having so much trouble uh, we don't have a strong scientific backing like you do on like europa clipper where you have 16 different instruments and people from all over the world care about what the spacecraft is doing on a minute by minute basis because their instrument is taking pictures or reading elements uh, msr is entirely um you know a, a glorified uh transport truck or a series thereof so the the scientists that are awaiting the samples, if they're still alive when they get here, care about that. Um, and and that's about, and we care about it as the engineers doing an engineering mission. Um, but it's hard for, you know, if you if you did some, if you're doing some work that was just slightly tangential to um, astrobiology or astrogeology on Mars, um, the funding of this project means that maybe your, your life's work, you're not going to see that mission go. And so it's easy to see the, uh, the reticence or the reluctance to really fully support this, even if you're like really close or related to the field, if it's not directly affecting you. So that, that's been one of our challenges for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So then that, 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 that makes me uh, think of another point about removing the mass constraints for the lander. Mm-hmm. 
we have a truly massive lander where we just like have a lot of excess margin. You can take additional payloads, scientific instruments, rovers mm -hmm. with you, right? So that, that would sort of up the... Um, Kind of like yeah, the bandwagon, but, but you want to simplify at the same time. You know, there's there's another conflicting oh, sure. set of like goals. Is like we want to simplify, but we need to engage the scientific community. Right. Um, you don't get to do both. Uh, you either yeah say hey wait your turn or you accept more risk in your in your mission design. I mean this this would be I would say this would be a little bit more in the if you were to use a vastly overpowered lander like Starship. Mm -hmm. Sure. Then the so added risk infinite is basically mass capability. If, infinite mass capability. <laughs> yeah. Then this is basically like CubeSats tacking, uh, uh, you know, yeah, sure. uh, tagging along on the Artemis One launch, right? Take a lot so, of risk. Well, that would also Everybody can. Cost control, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, you might be able to, to scrounge up funding from additional sources. And the other thing I was thinking about is that if uh, you are truly landing uh, a lot of mass, uh, you might be able to land some components um, or prove out some concepts that are relevant for Artemis uh, in the sense of that moon to Mars, you know, maybe that's a, a small nuclear reactor that they want to, they want to test out on Mars, uh, or maybe it's a, it's a hab or maybe it's a, um, you know, oxygen generation system, whatever. Like All right, or, or just, just yeah. that, 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 that idea of, can we land Starship on Mars? Yeah. You know, that might be that's able a, to get some Artemis funding. That's a great idea. Scott, I'm, I'm curious what you feel these other projects could be that could uh, gain value from such a transmission. I mean, it, there's tons and tons of science you can do there, but I think I'm kind of concerned that as you, you get more of these on there, that they, they could hamper the the whole project uh, or you know slow it down. I mean, you're doing it kind of out of desperation because you need that funding source. That's really the only reason you're doing it. So now you're going to put these other things on there. And what if it turns out that one of those payloads, there's something wrong with that payload that then ends up just ruining the mission, you know, it's because they're, you know, they're using lithium ion batteries in there or something yeah, like that. Explodes. You know, it's like, boom, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. you know, just, yeah. just some, some crazy risk. little thing that could go wrong. I mean, it's like, um, Although that, I mean, to my knowledge, that hasn't yeah. happened yet in space flight. Right? Yeah, it hasn't Having happened Having a secondary yet. payload mess up your primary mission. I don't, I don't know yeah, any, hope, uh, hopefully not. examples I'm just, of that. I just remember that example that Andy Weir talked about in, in the Martian when, when it was like down to like, like some food mm -hmm. that got like liquefied because yeah. the G's on acceleration was like too much. <laughs> and, it threw, and it was like quite this huge chain of events that kind of running off. Uh -huh. so, so sometimes so you're, you're really concerned that you could have these other True. things. And, you know, one of them, you know, it's like, how important is one of those things? Uh, see, what, what was the, the the latest mission that was delayed because they, they didn't have everything ready yet. And so just imagine that it's like the primary objective is to the return. Everything's ready. There's a secondary one, but it's also very important because let's say they're like 30% of your budget and they're behind <laughs> schedule and, and you may lose two years much. and you're like, ah, yeah. And then, and then the problem is like, okay, we wait two years, but the problem is the payload that you had was ready is now sitting in mothballs for two years. And it, yeah. I mean, it just, it doesn't come out of mothballs the same way it goes in. Right. So yeah. it, it's really hard trying to line all these objectives at the same yeah. time. And, and I would say, you know, just the best thing is that if, if there's a sense of urgency in getting these things back, then you do not want to over-design. You don't want to have too much capability. You want to go for in the software world, what we call the MVP. The minimum viable product. That's it. That's all you want. Just design around that, and let's not worry about anything else. That would be my approach. I I, I agree with that. If you know, as an engineer, the, the but then again, you get to remember, yeah. you know, space sciences is not engineering. It's half politics. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's 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 politics. It's uh, um, it's a lot of things, you know. And I think we have a lot of examples of NASA NASA missions where um, we. In fact, actually, even MSR is an example of forced collaboration between centers in order to distribute the money around the country to keep political entities happy, uh, right. which is part of the reason we have the problem. Um, it's a it's a it's a worthwhile goal, uh, but when you break things up like that, or add on capability, or offer rideshare services to someone else, it just drives mission complexity, uh, which is the very thing we're trying to to drop. 
Um, and so that, that's the frustrating part about where we are with MSR right now. It seems that in every category you check a box, um, we're constrained there or we're over the line. And so you can't make any trades because you have nothing to trade for. You can't trade mass for complexity. You can't trade budget for timeline. You can't trade uh, capability for uh, for timeline or cost. Um, and so we're just, what it comes down to, uh, and what I've decided is it's just a really, really hard mission. And we should expect that it's going to be one we've never... We're probably going to be bad at estimating costs because we've never done it before as humanity. You know, humanity's never done it before. Um, it's going to take longer than we originally guessed because human beings are optimists. And, uh, you know, it's going to cost more than we thought because, again, for the same reason. Um, I I get that when you don't have money, you shouldn't spend it. Um, but, you know... I don't want any, I don't want a pause or anything, but I would rather see a pause than the implication that everything's broken. We need to start all over again. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe it's just, we don't have the money to do it right now. And that's a very different message than um, throw it all away and start over, which is yeah, kind I, of. I want to ask you about that because I got the sense also, and, and as you've been saying, it kind of seems like a back to the drawing board. It doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily need to be that way. Um. <laughs> this might be one of those where uh, history will be the best judge. Mm -hmm. um, it, but I don't think so. I, I really don't. I think we have, I, I would, I would rather have seen, you know, if we're going to uh, loop in a bunch of um, new bright minds, um, let's do a scrub of the current architecture. It's not, you know, it's not export control. This is a, uh, you know, all the hardware that we have are, I don't know the level of detail that the information is available out there, but if you really wanted to go find designs on the stuff that we were planning to put on SRL, you could probably do that. Mm -hmm. um, so let's open the books to, you know, uh, people's critiques of it. Um, you know, NASA's done it internally now four times. Um, ironically, mm -hmm. always coming back with the same conclusions, almost like someone was copying homework. But uh, yeah, maybe that's... Yeah, that would be to me a faster way to start there yeah yeah i i remember um i was speaking to a senior source of mine at nasa a couple of months back uh and i there was a lot of frustration expressed at the time i was on it's quite i remember uh, mentioning this to you and in hindsight uh, i kind of understand that frustration that there were a, a lot of big ideas being tossed about but none of them were realistic about costs involved Mm. Um, and they seem, I, I, without saying much, the, my takeaway was that, um, a lot of people were completely at sea, uh, and it wasn't a good look, uh, and it was pretty evident from what I heard back then that the writing was clearly on the wall and that, you know, they would need to get out into the public, uh, public, uh, private industry, beg your pardon, to, to look for solutions. And, I keep, I kept hearing this repeated stress on the value of what NASA has done, uh, but at the same time, acknowledgement that they, they are a bit out of their depth right now, uh, and there's no clear path to finding a solution to the MSR problem. It, it may uh, be. I think just I see waiting. a lot in hindsight. Yeah, it, it could be that maybe a pause is not necessarily a bad thing. I know you don't want to hear this, Ben, but... Uh, you know, it's not necessarily like stopping it, but maybe slow walking it a little bit to to allow maybe some technologies to mature or get ready. Mm -hmm. And there is precedence for something like that. I know I'm going to reach somewhere else. It's like, you know, if you look at the filmmaker, James Cameron, he's had like all these films that he was wanting to do. And he, he realized at the time he couldn't make it because technology didn't exist yet. So he then waited. And then the sure. technology caught up to his vision. And it could be sort of the same thing that you can still work on a lot of the elements of this, but just say, you know what, maybe we just really need to take a pause and just wait for a couple of technological developments here and there and then reassess and come up with the architecture that way. I know it's frustrating because what that means is that you, you're going for that, that 2040 kind of uh, time frame, and, and we don't want to go out that far, but it may be that, um, who knows, may, maybe something 
does come along that suddenly makes it faster. I mean, you remember that there's that science fiction, famous science fiction story about <laughs> the space travelers that the first one's to head off towards like some star system with a slower mm -hmm. than light travel. <laughs> and when they get there, they get greeted mm -hmm. by the landing parties that have already been there for like 200 years because they invented faster than light travel, you know, along the way. Yep. So you, you never know. It could be something like that, that as you start to do it, then suddenly, you know, something else comes better because it is quite the golden age that we're seeing right now yeah, in sure. development and all sorts of different yeah. propulsion. Yeah. Which, I, mean, I, I don't I mean, disagree with that at all, but I, I mean, it does to me, uh, the possibility that something might come up that would give you the opportunity to surpass what you're doing right now should never be the reason not to try. If you yeah, feel like yeah, you're ready. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it, 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 sh it shouldn't be it's, cause, because you know, that's how you do push the frontiers. Yeah. But um, you know, like, like I dare you to go faster than me is how we get better. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah, Certainly, yeah. but sometimes it's it's these uh, these technologies that have absolutely nothing that weren't being developed for you for something else that just have to mature yeah. and suddenly when they come in you go that's what I'm looking for, yeah. you know how how many people are out there say you know I'm needing this solution I don't have it and they look around oh Chat GPT wow I wasn't expecting well, that and suddenly it changes everything. The the tough part is you know that I think I mentioned this in our last chat like. We, we are using technology in our missions uh, by direction that is, is decades old um, because of this addiction to heritage and legacy. It, it is what it is. Um, you know, it, it's a tongue in cheek word uh, to a lot of engineers is heritage. Um, and what does it mean on this day today? Uh, how does it apply? What is the, the reason we're using it? We're we using it to justify lower costs or we're we using it to justify higher reliability or we're we using it for both. Are we using it because there's some lying around and we just didn't want to go build some new ones? So there's like the context is is really uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a tough word um, to use to mean something concrete. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I saw, you know, in the discussion from the various uh, public engagements on this MSR um, state of things it was immediately contrasted with words that would invalidate its use. Um, and so th that, that I think is, they, they sound, there were word, you know, I think you said word salad. It sounded great. These are very, you know, colorful, happy words, um, but they made no sense together. <laughs> and, and so I think it's going to be, uh, and they definitely didn't make sense. I, I think future heritage maybe makes sense in the, in the context of <laughs> private industry, but yeah. um, future is not heritage anymore. You know, uh, yeah. that's mm -hmm. planned heritage. Yeah. Uh, ben, um, fly right. I, yeah. I, I have a question. You know, towards the end of uh, one sound bites, I the first, the second sound bite I played out. I noticed. Um, I'm not sure who she was, but I'm going to see if I can. Um, uh, you know, looking looking at ways that we can infuse um, new ways of uh, of doing things, and possibly from different industries. From different industries, yes. Yeah, uh, what and, did that, and that what, struck me that she, it was very important for her to interject that in there. Yes, it's a very it's very a good point. question. I have no idea. I asked the same thing yesterday, and um, what industries? Because um, we we don't consider you know you don't consider defense as a separate industry or or aeronautics it's kind of just part of aerospace so what industries are we going to go to yeah um well you know we... elon when when he was building you know he, he wanted starship built he he went to uh water tower builders right so that's uh... yeah yeah maybe <laughs> Welders, yeah, exactly. But I don't know I if there's like any like not impactful here, for but... her to be super important that she added that on at the end. It was just very <laughs> weird to me. Uh, yeah, to a lot of us wondering why, what other industries, you know, like, yeah, yeah. and and I, yeah. I, yeah, I'm wondering if she meant to say other industry partners or something like that. I I don't know that other industries really fits like very well in that context. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not going to go get a taxi driver to go pick it up. Um, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. So uh, I, I just want to get get back for a, for a bit to the elephant in the room. You know, we talked a little yeah. bit about Starship, right? And we, and then and hey, then that's me. To, can anybody? Don't call uh, me an elephant. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's sitting right there behind me. That's the elephant in the room. <laughs> 
so a long we, trunk. you know we, we we immediately ask the question like can can anybody else do it right like yeah. you know spacex has the motivation um they they are wanting to go anyway on on a more ambitious timeline can anybody else do it and one thing that i i feel the need to ask is do we need somebody else to do it like just because we're talking about private industry. Does that does it necessarily need to be competed between two or more equal uh, competitors? Well, uh, it's not competitive bid unless you have more than one, right? Yes, but does it need to be a competitive bid? I mean, that's what NASA said yesterday yeah, for the study, right? For the for the funded yeah. study. So. You know, everybody puts out their their stuff. They they spend what like a few hundred thousand each or like a few million each on on the, the ninety day studies. I mean, yeah. I'm assuming like I don't know what, what the actual amounts it, are. I think it's I think it's two millions allocated for the uh, for all of for this all is of actually them just no this this one's kind of weird because this is just a um, the roses call for um, proposals is is actually just a call. F it's it's weird. They they're they're saying well. Give us your rough idea, your one pager, and then maybe we'll give you money to give you the ten pager kind of thing. Yeah, um, and mm -hmm. I don't remember what the total dollar amount per um, RFI was, but uh, I think it was it was on the order of two million, uh, two million per awardee. Okay, but um, cool. So two million per per player, and and then yeah, and then going from there, you know, you have the studies, and maybe at the end of the day, you decide, look. We have this entity that we've already contracted sure. out to do the first Artemis landings. They are planning to build um, atmospheric reentry capability in support of the Artemis landings. They already ha are, are in talks with the DOD to do um, cargo transport, uh, like Earth cargo transport, which might involve um, unprepared surface landings. And we've got unprepared mm -hmm. surface landings on the moon. What if we come up with a NASA plan to leverage that existing industry technology in, in a non-competed way? to um, bring the budget in order. Can we go to SpaceX and say, hey, like, here's how much money we have to do this. Can you do what you did uh, for HLS and bring it over here? Is that is there a law against that? I, I don't think there's a law against it. I don't even think it's uh, abnormal. Um, I, I do know that when you have... Um, cost plus contracts, which is essentially what you're describing, uh, you end up with ULA, um, yeah. SLS. Those are examples of non-competed contracts with private industry. Right. So does it, does it have to be cost plus just because it's non-competed? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think it inevitably comes cost plus if you don't have an alternate supplier because you commit to it because you spent a certain amount and there's only one supplier. <laughs> if there is that if they if they say we can't do it anymore what are you gonna do right you, you, you yeah if they're like oh well, we can't do it for this price sorry you know this will put us out of business etc cetera, etc cetera. um right you know we'll pay the penalty but you know that that means the five billion dollars put in so far from the federal government is no longer worth anything uh the federal government's gonna print more money and and give them more money yeah um, okay now uh maybe we look at the pause then and we were, we we're talking sure. about p potentially pausing this if spacex wants to get starship on mars in roughly five years you know give or take a synod or two if you know can we watch them do that and then and then as they get up to that you know get closer to that date uh, say hey <laughs> can we put a, a demo payload in support of a potential uh, Mars sample return mission later on. And if you pull this off, then, uh, you know, we, we, we have a reasonable expectation that you can, you can land on Mars and that you're not, and you know how much it's going to cost. You're not going to pull out of this. And, you know, in a synod or two, we, uh, we put a, put an actual nav on there. Um, I, I think we can definitely do that. I don't know how much it's really going to save you because like the core elements of the lander, for example, sample return mm -hmm. lander, you can remove the um, the EDL stages, uh, but you still need uh, the RTG for survival year round. You still need 
um, a lot of the expensive bits are still there. Uh, uh, so the RTG, if you have several tons of uh, methane and oxygen floating around in the main tanks, can you just... It, if you could plug into Starship, then then that removes the yeah. need for the RTG. Because um, you don't need to move around, right? Like you can just sit tight, wait no, no, for, it's, for it's, helicopters yeah. to bring the samples to you. You plug into Starship. You got solar panels. You got you got uh, methox on board. You can keep warm. Yeah. No, I mean you can. If there, there would be a, a lot of interfacing to interfaces sure. to be evaluated here. Um, mm -hmm to determine whether that makes sense or not, I guess. Um, so it could make sense, you know, the, as a first pass answer, but, um, but we'd have to look at, we'd have to understand what the parameters of that question really are. Um, yeah. And then, you know, that would imply that you're building this lander return vehicle, uh, not knowing whether you're going to have a, a way to get it on the surface or not, because you wouldn't want to build and design both one that could get itself down and one that could hitch a ride. Um, right. And then what if the plan was to send humans just two years later, which is, you know, almost faster than you would get the samples back anyway, then what's the point? <laughs> what's the point? Yep. Yeah. That's a fair question. So I think once he gets, once we're able to get one starship over there, it's not a long stretch to get a bunch of them, you know? Yeah. 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 With humans so, or potentially with Optimus, I can hey, run around and collect exactly. everything and then. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I was trying to wonder is like depending on how close you could get whether you would need the helicopters or whether whether you could figure whether you could send out a humanoid bots it it. it's just yeah. this is going to be a question of power you know it's like can it make start. that that walk and return back without the batteries running out yeah yeah I mean if we're talking about a few kilometers of range then I think that that should be very achievable yeah that that'll that'll be close if you but... can so yeah, that's, the, that's, the, that's a good thing to warm. talk about, actually. Um, and it's something that I didn't realize was a, a concern until doing some of the newer helicopter work. Um, one has to prove a certain reliability of guided entry and navigability during entry before mm -hmm. one's allowed to place their landing ellipse over, over the, <laughs> uh, the rover. Yeah. So you have an infinitesimally small uh, risk of blowing the rover up and all of the samples, um, but you have to prove that you're not going to do it. So uh, when we're looking at some helicopter contingency <clears throat> options um, with a ballistic entry into the Mars atmosphere, uh, we could be up to 110 kilometers away from the rover and have to mm -hmm. traverse that before we can even start retrieving samples and bringing it to the lander. So... Um, the this point. is an, an engineerable problem but uh depending on how you do edl uh, it can be a very very challenging problem and in some ways more challenging than the the core mission itself so so one thing that I'm, i was curious about curious about ben is uh we're talking about the rover being um you know going up the crater rim how scalable is the rim and the surrounding terrain for a the it, rover and b uh, uh something something else like the ltb or I, it's, it's, bot. It's, there are you know it's a it's a river delta so it's kind of a smooth grade um i think you the total traverse is about a thousand feet because uh, you're not going all the way up to mean sea level it's uh it's yeah just to the crater rim so um i i think uh there is a path that is fairly benign um but there's there's no real-time remote driving, so anything on the LTV would have to be made fully autonomous. Right. Um, so, you know, that's one of the, the rover challenges. It's one of the reasons it takes so long to get to and fro. Um, and keep in mind, uh, to go, yeah, and keep in mind, like, to go the, I think it's five and a half miles up to where it will turn around, that's going to take four and a half years for the rover. Um, yeah because yeah because we're not real time driving because um you know it's stopping and taking some samples but curiosity which has been there since 2013 has only driven 11.1 kilometers in its entire life yeah so if it have to make has to make a four and a half uh, kilometer traverse to get to where the rover is waiting um it's a very it's expect years yeah. okay so here's my next question so it seems like 
even having so you know um the uh, like autonomous uh, navigation through through mars terrain is is at a low enough trl that we don't want to rely on that for bringing mars samples back at this stage it seems like even having people in mars orbit uh, could actually be really useful for sure. driving down that latency so you can have remote driving at uh, the you know cruising speed of the of the rover which would get you I mean, how yeah? How fast uh, does uh, Percy go? Uh, about a kilometer per hour. Okay, so so you could, Slow. in theory, and and I assume that it uh, it can't do um, continuous uh, driving through night with uh, with just solar charge no. while. Okay, no, so let's say let's say we're looking at watts out of the RTG, and the consumption's way higher than that. So they spend most of the time just sitting still. Okay, so if you were to max out daily driving, um, I'm gonna just go ahead and make some estimates here. But uh, you know, 2,400 watt hours per soul, um, and let's say a flight takes about a uh, thousand watt hours, um, so one kilowatt hour essentially. Um, yeah. A, a, a very small fraction of what your house uses is what it takes to drive. Um, then uh, it's covering about a uh, thousand watt hours of thermal. Um, it, it can probably go for about an hour a day. Okay. So yeah. we're looking at a kilometer a day, like max of a kilometer a day, um, max a kilometer a day. So if you want it to move 200 kilometers, line, no avoidance, etc. Okay. So if you were to send, uh, you know, Mars orbiter with people, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you would be there for, I mean, if you wanted to do a conjunction uh, mission, then you'd be there for about a year and a half in Mars orbit. So you would have the opportunity for uh, traveling up to 500-ish kilometers with Percy. I mean, I don't know if the wheels would handle that, but uh, at least. <laughs> um, I mean, that's 50 times the total distance the person or the curiosity is driven. Right, um, right. So, so I'm guessing it's not built for that. But, you know, you could have another right. rover that was built for that um, be remotely driven. And presumably, I mean, you, you, if you, you, could, you could go a little bit faster with something that was designed to go faster. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah Perseverance is not designed to go fast. Or even so, far. So okay. So even if you were talking about a landing, uh, yeah, ballistic uh, landing ellipse of like over 100 kilometers, and having to land outside of that range, it's not crazy to think about a rover traversing that, getting the samples, and getting back to the MAV uh, within a reasonable amount of time. If you send, if either you have autonomous navigation or you send people to at least Mars orbit, yes. So it's not, I mean, it, it can't be unreasonable because that's a, a key mission parameter. If Perseverance dies, we need another way to get it. Um, it's why our focus has really been on the helicopters because we can cover large distances um, mm. and we're agnostic to terrain. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's really been the thrust towards helicopters. Um, and I, I think at this point, my feeling is that's the best option, um, especially as we size up. Yeah, as we size up, we can carry multiple tubes per sortie. Um, can go you know three plus kilometers per flight or per soul we and then if we start looking at more um you know dare i say uh novel or riskier approaches we can use some of the hardware that we use for ingenuity to um retool terrain relative navigation and then you don't have to worry about ballistic entry anymore and then you can have a smaller landing ellipse and you can select your landing sites um so mm -hmm. th there are there's a lot of very promising uh, technical solutions um, that we've been working on that relate to helicopters. Uh, we're running it. We ran up in against some real pushback about the need for heritage and reliability, and so we weren't allowed <laughs> to pursue them very far. Um, so that, that so was, that was frustrating challenge. to hear that uh, you know they're opening this up with uh, with different rules about it is reliability. It, it's you know. It, 
you know, just tell me what you want is what a lot of us feel, you know? Um, yeah. And we I, want to deliver the best help. products possible. Yeah. I just, you know, I'm worried, Ben, I, and this is a big picture question, I guess, but mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen the shift to an increasing amount of dependence on the private sector. Um, and we're now, now you have this problem with the MSR program, right? There's a, there are a lot of critics who say that, you know, NASA should just map the roadmap, right? And leave the tech and science to the private sector. But there's a risk because the private sector tends to do what is, you know, financially rewarding to them. Yeah, it's got to make money. And NASA does so much of science that is rewarding to the public at large. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, mm -hmm. I know, I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering, are we kind of, endangering that good science if i can call it that for the better good rather with uh, everything that we're experiencing i mean i think it would be really cool if um we if spacex got us down to the surface i uh, and then we you know launched it all, back off like that would solve a lot of problems it solve a lot of the mass margin problems some of the complexity problems um but we're willing to baseline it for human missions to the moon, a vehicle that doesn't yet exist, but we weren't willing to do it for um, a science mission to Mars. I don't agree yeah. with that. Um, yeah. That seems very strange to me, uh, but I also, you know, it seems very strange to me that we're, we're putting tens of billions of dollars into SLS for, for a future that's going nowhere. Um, but we're not willing to put 10 into uh, getting samples back that will change human history uh, and our understanding of everything. Those are poor budgetary decisions in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just take ingenuity for, as an example, there's been mm -hmm. so much of success with it. It was what meant to be, you know, three flights, just about two mm -hmm. or three flights, right? I yeah. Just it was a uh, minimum and one, I, I, and, yeah. ideally three. Yeah. I just look, look what you guys have achieved. And now yeah. there's 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 the next version in in the works in January two. Well, part, now part of uh, SMSR included uh, the sample recovery or sample retrieval helicopters, um, and uh, but as of yesterday, it's officially no longer baseline. There was a uh, quote a non concur uh, with yeah. the IRB's so, findings. Um, so, so that's, that's gone. That's there's no future helicopter yeah, work right that's, now. That's what, that's We've that's given it up. And we're not going right to do it anymore. It's whoa. Not, what? They're yeah. dead. Like uh, NASA has. Uh, that was the best ended thing. That any out. active helicopter programs, uh, full stop. Well, wait, 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 what about Dragonfly? Okay. Uh, that's an interesting one. Um, Dragonfly is still ongoing. It is a, a couple of multiples of its original cost cap, but. Um, but but no Mars helicopters. No more Mars helicopters. Okay, folks. Uh, this I'm, is I'm so news. sorry. This is this is crazy. This is um, I don't know what to say. This is look. All things aside, you know, just speaking as layman, the power of those images, or the first flight on another planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a lot more powerful for me. Than yeah, the Artemis message one. that went out, just how inspiring it was to see yeah. that. Yeah. And re remember one other thing that they did, which you would say would violate any risk profile, is you took a small piece from the right flyer, right? And that yep. was mounted on there? Yep. 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 It was inside the fuselage. I mean, that's that's how yes. important it was. But you think about it. Yep. I mean, th that little token there, something could have gone wrong in the process. Or, you know, it's like it, it yep. adds a small bit yeah, of risk like to the whole thing. But it was so significant that it was worth the risk to put that in there. You know, like in the in the office space of the, the helicopter area that I, I work in, um, under lock and key is uh, the first flight log for another planet. Like, you know, we keep a mm -hmm. flight log on there. It's handwritten pilot's notes. Um, and yeah, we that's uh, it's it's pretty powerful to like be around that. And, you know, when I talk to people from outside of JPL and outside the industry, they know significantly more about uh, Mars helicopter than anything else uh, that I think NASA's done since Apollo. So 
It's like we went to the moon, and then we put helicopters on. And then we put helicopters. Exactly. Yeah. And the expectation is like mess around with a shuttle somewhere in there. What's what's the next? Yeah. What's the follow up? Yeah. No, there's there's nothing right now. Um, That's uh, unbelievable. uh, Can we can Uh, we crowdsource it? Crowdfund it? (laughs) Um, We're. I mean, so there's a small team of us that are working on concepts and. Part of that includes uh, talking to potential private partners uh, and, and trying to get a ride as a demo payload or something like that. Could certainly crowdsource it. Um, you know, uh, I think, you know, it, it's just a. I think it's I think it's the most inspirational thing we've done in a very long time and for, sure. for very little money. Um, yeah. So. We, I don't know. It's exciting to to think about not only the capabilities, but just um, making Mars more like Earth. If we knew we can, if we know we can fly there and use that as. Uh, yeah. And I also think that building GNC platforms, you know, guidance, navigation, and control platforms that are agnostic uh, to whether it's a rotorcraft or an um, impulse thruster or something like that, or is a really powerful thing because then you um, build low cost, low weight. Um, or low mass uh, pieces of hardware that you can throw on the moon with some cold gas thrusters. You can, you know, you put them literally, literally anywhere. You just change the software a little bit to to adjust the way it controls um, and gain, etc. Um, yeah. But that's a helicopter type platform. It's something like another parallel effort that we're conceptualizing. But there's no there's no appetite for um, actual development of helicopter hardware. Uh, for Do Mars you know and- why? Um, not that I will say here. I, I don't know why. I spe- I have speculations. Yeah, speculations. Say, though. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I will add. Today, today yeah. is the absolute last downlink from Ingenuity. Um, so, uh, pour a drink for for Ingenuity. Uh, this this afternoon is the last downlink. Wow. So Ingenuity. And and why is that the last downlink? Ingenuity. Because there, there's no more vital data. Really um, the rover's out of range, right? Uh, it's yeah, it's going to be rovers out of range. Um, you know, they the ingenuity did not have direct orbit comms capability, so it has to relay through the rover. Um, rovers moving you know, either behind a hill or too far, most likely, you know, obstructed by a hill or something like that. Okay. Um, but they're calling today the official last downlink from ingenuity. But it can still do a little bit of uh, data collection there, even if it can't transmit it. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a little bit limited. It, it just the images. camera's face downward, yeah. so that's tough. Um, you know, the it, it's it's utility. It's utility like it, without being able to move is essentially a measure of solar radiation at that particular point. You know. We, that's yeah. the best data we're getting is like how much I, energy are you collecting right here? I think the other data I heard was something about just like looking at the soil right beneath it and seeing how it might change because of wind and yeah. everything else. So that that's, would be that's it. So definitely it, true. It, it doesn't have a weather station built into it. it doesn't have a temperature pressure. No, or no. Like Does it have audio? It has an altimeter in it. Um, altimeter. But I think okay. it's, it's a laser altimeter. Um, oh, okay, so it's not the, a barometer. No, no. Uh, but it, it does have an know, audio, right? It does. No, 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 there's no audio on. Okay, so where did we get that audio from? The, the audio I think that came from the rover. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it, what it does, what it can and has been doing for us that's really powerful is uh, because it's no longer flying and we don't have dust clearing events, um, it gives us a good idea of the accumulatory nature of dust on solar arrays up there. Which has been super valuable data as we as we conceptualize for the future. Yeah. Um, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, the, the it's. It, I think eventually the rover might come back into contact range with it, so it would be interesting to see if we come back in two years or so and it's still mm-hmm. alive. Um, that will be very very good data. Uh, but they're calling today the official um, last transmission. Wow. So. Wow. That's a downer. Well, Thank you, Ben. That is a downer. <laughs> it's it's okay, you know, like yeah. Um, 
if if we would have spent to keep it alive longer, uh, you know, designed to keep it alive longer, then it may not have made the mission because it was too expensive, and then we wouldn't be celebrating like the plucky little helicopter that could. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, then, I think yeah. it, it was great. It was great for so, us. I I just wish that we would have a follow up. I, I feel I like we should be sending helicopters to to Mars every two years. Yeah, there's I agree. no reason in my mind mm-hmm. that we as a, as a civilization aren't sending orbiters and rovers and helicopters to Mars every two years. Yeah. I agree. Well, um, the hardest part is landing them there, um, and but we're pretty good at that. Yeah. Sorry, I gotta go. No worries. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. So um, I need to ask. I need to ask you this: um, the thirty tubes. Right, that uh, are expected first. Return of the first thirty tubes in the first batch. What are they made up of? And they're they're going to be selected based on particular criteria. Can you give us some insight at all? So, I I, I can't really give insight into the selection criteria because the down selection of, or the the reduction in tube collection requirements is a new thing as of yesterday. Um, we've been working again to the, uh, requirement of 30 tubes must are there and 30 must be returned uh, up until this point. So, um, so I don't know how they will be prioritized and knowing that they're not all collected yet, it's almost certain that, uh, some of those collected in the future will become higher priority. Um, but the, as far as what is in them, um, if you go to NASA's website, there's actually quite a good description of, of their contents and it describes them as, you know, for example, regolith or um, sedimentary rock or, uh, you know, suspected elements of, of certain um, carbaceous or like fossil like materials. Um, so, so, so essentially clues, uh, samples that, that would give us clues about the origins of Mars whether life existed at any point in time what is geology is like that, that's right yeah i'd say it's focused on astrobiology uh astrogeology and um you know that's that's what they're looking for you know are was life here uh the golden ticket is of course like you know true organic fossils or something like that um but the the target really is uh, the types of sedimentary rock that tend to preserve uh, biological structures for long periods of time. So, um, yeah, it looks like right now we got 24 of them. Um, and I don't think that that includes uh, the witness samples, which are basically control samples taken to verify that uh, whatever you're this the samples that were taken at the same time um you didn't have some sort of contamination or what the uh take a snapshot of what the ambient environment was like so right. we'll need those as well for people that do right. photography it's like a dark frame yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. well well it's it's been a a mixed chat a mixed feelings <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. hope and sadness, uh, but it's, uh, I mean, it's just so much to take away and hey, just let's, let's just hope for a better future. Let's hope, hope solutions yep. uh, emerge and, you know. You I know. will add real, real, real quick, um, yeah. you know, the people at NASA, JPL um, are, are standing by and ready to help make this mission ma- happen, or whether we're supporting NASA directly or whether we're supporting private industry. Uh, yeah. We think this is extremely important. Um, and uh, whoever's funded to to make this happen, uh, there are people will, ready to help you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Let me plop your uh, social media profiles. Um, this is uh, Scott Walter at Going Ballistic Five on X. Ozan uh, is at Ozan Bellick. and this is Ben on LinkedIn and uh, on X. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Scott and Ben and uh, Ozan, who was with us a couple of minutes back. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful having you. And um, I suspect we're going to have follow-up discussions because there's so much to talk about here. And uh, yep. let's hope for the future. Yeah. 
I'm looking forward to seeing the proposals. Um, yeah. You know, it'll be good. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks.